at the crossroads of two continents. Istanbul, has played a significant role between the East and the West. Turkey, is a true melting pot of culture, in the remains of its ancient city. Walk through this journey, in this part of the Muslim world, and understand, the Islamic architectural heritage. This madraza, is the epitome of the Ottoman architecture, a center to propagate the Islamic theology, a masterpiece, by the greatest architect of all time, Mimar Sinan. This, is Rustam Pasha Madraza. Istanbul, first known as Byzantium, and previously known as Constantinople, is the largest city in Turkey, composing the country's economic, cultural and historical heart. Home to 14 million people, the city forms one of the largest urban city in Europe, second largest in the Middle East, and the fifth largest city in the world by populations. This transcontinental city, lies between Asia and Europe, one of the only four of its kind. The city's continental borders, are divided by the Bosporus Strait, which lies in the northwestern part of Turkey, and between the Marmara Sea and the Black Sea. Due to its geostrategic location, Istanbul, has witnessed many conquests before its name, it was the capital of different empires for thousands of years. Its first name, Byzantium, comes from Megara King Byzas, as it became the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Later on, in 330, Byzantium became the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire and was called Constantinople. The city flourished, as an Islamic Empire, when the Ottoman Turks, led by Sultan Mem Fatih II, conquered Constantinople in 1453. Renamed as Islambul, the city became the capital of the Ottoman Empire and prospered as a major cultural, political, and commercial center. Istanbul, in its urban context, is composed of a rather complex layer of architectural history. The city, has developed over historical remains at times making use of the existing structure, resulting in a unique mix of historic significance and urban language. The district of Fatih, is one of the most popular tourist districts in Istanbul. Being located in the heart of Istanbul, at the center for the best examples of Ottoman Turkish lifestyle and architecture, embodies unique works of important civilizations. Due to these qualities, Fatih is known as the first Istanbul. Tourism in Fatih, brought along other economic benefits, to the small-scale local trades and commercial business. Boutique hotels, novelty cafes, and souvenir shops, flourished in the historical peninsula. The buildings that belong to Byzantine times, they were not destroyed. Uh, the churches, most of them were converted into mosques and Hagia Sophia being the biggest one. You see, uh, Hagia Sophia, even the name remained. It was Hagia Sophia Church, it became Hagia Sophia Mosque. It is very interesting. Valuable monuments from Roman, Byzantine and Ottoman periods, complexes of palaces, mosque, medrasas, churches, hammams and caravanserai, scattered throughout the old district, subtly intertwined among the rolling hills and picturesque offshores. Nestled in the heart of the commerce district in the Jalalu neighborhood, lies one of the Ottoman structures, preserved in an authentic condition, and in used until today, Rustam Pasha Madraza. This small, yet significant historical madraza, was designed by arguably, the greatest and most influential architect of Islamic architecture, the Ottoman architectural master, Koja Mimus Sinan, who lived from 1489 to 1588. In the 16th century, 
Another personality marked really the city of Istanbul. This is the great architect Sinan. Ser Mimaran Hasta, meaning the chief imperial architect. He lived during the zenith of the Ottoman Empire, during the reigns of Sultan Selim I, Sultan Suleiman, Sultan Selim II, and Sultan Murad III. Sinan was basically minister of construction mm -hmm. and personal architect of the court because he was like today minister for construction in charge but same what was doing like take Norman Foster. During this time, the iconic skyline of Istanbul was changed forever with the beautiful additions of great imperial mosques. The construction of the Madraza began in 1547 and was completed in 1550 by the order of the Grand Vizier, Rustam Pasha, to the architect Sinan, as documented in a four-lined inscription in Persian, mounted above the entrance door to the Madraza. First Istanbul was very built in that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And Rustam Pasha came, became very rich and he tried to build everywhere. It is one of the first, in a series of edifices designed by Sinan, at the request of the Grand Vizier, followed by the Rustam Pasha Mosque in Takirda, in 1553, and in Titikale, in 1561. Rustam Pasha, uh, you know, uh, he wanted to have uh, a complex with the mosque, but uh, it is far away, it is not close, so we cannot consider it as a co part of a complex. So it is a single building. The mosque is down in Tahtaka. Unlike Sinan's more celebrated imperial buildings, located in picturesque hilltops, such as the Suleimania complex, Rustam Pasha Madrasa is an independent madrasa, unattached to any complexes or mosque. It is almost hidden, within a compact network of multiple-story shop houses. In the Ottoman period, the surrounding context was a mix of residential complex on the southwestern side, and commercial buildings on the northwestern side. The wooden residential complexes, were later destroyed in the Hoja Pasha fire. Rustam Pasha Madrasa, is located in the part of Istanbul, which had a network of undulating passageways. At first, the building seemed to fit into the site, to accommodate the orientation of the site. But upon further analysis, the main classroom, is oriented perpendicular to the direction of the Kipla. Rustam Pasha Madrasa exemplifies the standard of Institute of Higher Learning, and the marvel of Sinan's work of architecture. The Ottomans had a very established educational system, that supported their vast empire, through more than 400 years. Until the turn of the 19th century, which marks the downfall of the Ottoman Empire, and the start of the modern secularist period in Turkey. In 1920, uh, as you know, the first government was established in, in Ankara. Mustafa Kemal and his friends are actually planning to change the structure of, of the state from a religious and Islamic one into a secular one. The building was abandoned in the 1800s. Its once glorious condition, left in a disheveled state, hidden among overgrowth. But in the case of Rustam Pasha uh, Medrese, I think it was um, given to the institution uh, who takes care of orphan children. It was like an orphanage. The building is recently restored again, and is now given to the Istanbul Foundation for Science and Culture, to be used for scholarly and cultural purposes. Now, this building was dedicated to our foundation for the cultural uh, and social and cultural activity. Part of the building now has a permanent museum, to show historical documents about Said Nursi and his book collection, The Rizaleh, Enor.
The layout of the building, is particularly different from other Sinan's works on Madrasa. Generally, the building is a composition of an octagon, inscribed within a square. From outside it is rectangular, but inside it is octagonal. And Sinan said that I did once and I will never try again. <laughs> the Madrasa, can be divided into four major zones. As one enters the main entrance, it leads to an E1, which opens up directly, to a spacious public courtyard. The courtyard is surrounded by portico, also called rewak, that acts as a transition to the cells surrounding them. The inner cells are arranged around E1s, which are semi-private in nature. There are 22 cells altogether, each with its own dome. The highest hierarchy, is identified in the placement of a large classroom, extruding to the south, elevated on a platform and mounted by the largest dome. The Dersh army, is approximately 64 square meters, is the prime focus of the madrasa, which serves as the main classroom, as well as a prayer hall. This is the classroom, uh, maybe uh, the professor would uh, sit there and uh, he would have the students around during the lecture. The classroom is accessible through a monumental door, ornamented with geometric motifs, product of the Kuhn de Curry technique, and mounted by a segmental arch, formed by piecing together marble. The significance of the room as a prayer hall is indicated by a simple mirror on the Qibla side. During the restoration of the Madrasa, the mihrab was redesigned to be in simpler form. The interior is further decorated by a single Romu kanas, carved on Malta Tasha limestone. The acoustical performance of the classroom, was optimized by means of the hollowed dome, facilitating the process of teaching and learning. The design of the students' rooms is basically a reflectance of the main classroom, but rather in a smaller scale. Some of them are equipped with an attached recess. The student's room however, is designed with a small yet deep opening. The main intention was to have a better control, over the thermal conditions of the room, as it helps to prevent from loss of heat. Uh, usually people say that uh, they bend and uh, uh, had its kind of respect, but also when you have big doors you lose a lot of heat, you know, it's a conservation of energy. Every room houses a fireplace, resulting in a unique repetitive effect of the series of chimneys. The niches, shelves and racks are recessed deep into the thick masonry walls. Some of the cells are still in use as dormitories, while others are adopted with different functions. Mimar Sinan had tried to improve, and develop his buildings, to withstand the most violent force of nature. For centuries, earthquakes in Istanbul, had severely damaged many buildings. As Istanbul is close uh, to a big fault, and as there are big earthquakes, many buildings were affected. Uh, he, he tries to bond his buildings. Uh, for example, here you have iron bars. Mm -hmm. These are uh, for the stability. It is not, you know, if you don't have these ties, uh, they can move and uh, collapse easily. Mm -hmm. But these are uh, binding. Uh, so Mimar Sinan, he added these supporting elements to strengthen the building, to make it more uh, strong er against earthquakes. Therefore, each structural members in the madrasa, work together to rectify this problem. The foundation system, is presumed to consist of timber piling with ties, 5 to 6 meters deep. Then it is layered with rubble stones, and special mix mortar, approximately 2 meters deep below the ground level. The load-bearing walls and floorings, are laid above this level. The rework that surrounds the courtyard, is supported by 24 Marmara columns. The circular columns, are found along the rework which lines alongside the courtyard. Meanwhile the corner columns are located on the octagonal points at the changes of angle. 
The shaft is connected to the capitals with iron pin. The capitals are decorated with several types of ornamentation, baklava motif which are mixture of simple lozenged forms, and parmet motifs, which can be found recurring in all buildings by Sinan. Wrought iron tie beam is used to strengthen the formwork between the columns alongside the rewak to the load-bearing walls of the building. The structural features are further enhanced using arches. Apart from its structural characteristics, the arches are also used to indicate a space or an entrance portal. In the madrasa, there are five types of arches. At the entrance, pensi arch and segmental arch are used. Some segmental arches interlocking voussoir. Drop arches are used at the major entrances and alongside the rewax of the madrasa which creates a boundary with the courtyard. The intriguing feature on these arches is the remains of different stone inset of floral and geometrical motifs. The irregular placement of the stone insets, which are still visible today, suggests that a more complete set of stone carving had been lost due to decay. A single tulip on one of the arches is said to be Sinan's own signature. The wall which supports the roofing systems are load-bearing walls, which is made up of hewn limestone and bricks, filled with coras and mortar. Reinforced by wrought iron tie rods, embedded horizontally, every one and a half to two meters in the wall. The coras mix is mixed with honey and ostrich egg white to prevent spider webs. Sinan artfully intermixed various masonry designs to achieve different results. Outside, the floor is covered with random ashlar cut stones, while in the interior, hexagonal terracotta tiles are used. For many years, domes have imprinted the image of Istanbul and the signature of Sinan's. Built with a total of 53 domes, the madraza features three different sizes of this particular element. The biggest dome is located at the Dirjane of the Madrasa. The second is located at the museum. The third is located at the cells, and the smallest domes are above the rewak. The arches will transfer the load received from the domes, pendentives and walls above them to vertical bearing elements. To resolve the problem of passing from a square plan to a circular dome, pendentives are used. It resembles a quarter dome shape and it provides a smoother transition. The domes on this building are made of bricks of diminishing radii, which is covered by mud plaster. Then, thick lead sheets are used as the final covering. On top of the domes are phenials of simple design. The brick size is here, but they might be 32, 34, something like that. Uh, they built a uh, formwork and uh, put on it. Uh, of course, uh, going yeah, like that. <laughs> Perhaps the most unique feature of the madrasa, which sets it apart from Mother Sinan's madrasas, is the octagonal courtyard. It functioned as a private space for the occupants, exhibiting social, environmental, and therapeutic potentials. The ablution fountain, once hidden between among flowers and saplings, located at the center of the courtyard, forms a central axis of the building. The octagonal forms make for an attractive central garden and gave lively circular movement to the rewak. Now, due to changes in the function of the courtyard, the grass was replaced with stone pavement. And wooden decks are extended from the rewak to be used as spaces for meeting and dining. In the end, Sinan never used this plan again. The triangular areas are wasteful of space. The rectangular alcove in the cells provides additional space. However, it does not compensate for the areas lost and is neither integrated, nor, eliminated. The use of arches to carry the mass of the domes allow the wall to contain extra window for daylighting. Sinan exhibits a meticulous and thoughtful design of window placement, using clustery windows and oculuses, to draw in optimum light into the interior.
the natural lighting level, is well balanced throughout the classroom, which makes it ideal for carrying out visual tasks such as reading and writing. Natural lights are reflected and diffused into the classroom. These diffuse lights are gained, by using deep windows at body level and few sets of double windows, at above eye level, called the clears tories. A distinctive corner window is designed in some of the rooms, whereby the inner section of the wall is slanted, to maximize daylight penetration. Another distinguished detail, is seen in the making of the outer circular opening of the double window, as a way to gain daylight, through the circular stucco openings. Sinan's buildings are illuminated with iron chandeliers hanging off the center of a dome, which are made of wrought iron, with glass casing. During the Ottoman period, candles were used instead of light bulbs. Hence it was hung lower, to allow the dim light to light up the space. Faultless attention to detail, is the mark of Sinan's building. Cornus's projects beyond sprandles, and rain spouts reaches beyond the facade. These are precautions against the damage by rain, or by erosion of mortar. Before Sinan, the Ottoman Medrasas was an evolved version of Seljuk's architecture, and Sinan himself did not drastically modify it. Staying true, to its Seljuk origin, Rustam Pasha Medrasa, is not so different from other Medrasas in Istanbul. Typically, they would consist of a central courtyard, ringed by Riwak, surrounded with rooms. The purpose is to provide direct circulation from the rooms to the courtyard, and to provide enough lighting and ventilation into the rooms. The madrasas were simple, and sparsely decorated. The domes are a prevalent feature of the madrasas. They augment the characteristic of the skyline of Istanbul, hence the name, the City of the Thousand Domes. However, in each of Sinan's madrasas, he would include a personal touch, hence we would see a unification of mosque and madrasa, situated around a common courtyard, such as Mirima Sultan Madrasa the L-shaped layout in Semsi Pasha Madrasa. Or in the case of Rustam Pasha Madrasa, an octagonal courtyard, inscribed within a square. In fact this octagonal plan is not the first example among the Ottoman Madrasas. The inspiration is owed to a pre sinan structure, the Buyokar Madrasa in Amasha, built by Husaynar in 1488, 62 years before the completion of Rustam Pasha Madrasa. In the fifth century, a similar madrasa was built there. Uh, it is told uh, maybe uh, Mimar Sinan was inspired by this, you see, because this uh, octagonal planning uh, is not frequent. Mimar Sinan would always experiment with his buildings to find the best possible architectural solutions. The madrasa is truly octagonal, whereas Sinan squared the external corners of his madrasa, and incorporated the washrooms, and other offices, in the triangular area which he thus created. Unlike Buyokar Madrasa, Rustam Pasha Madrasa is located in a compact city area, hence the need to optimize the available land. Both of the madrasas display similarities in the overall layout of an octagonal courtyard, surrounded by riwak, and ringed by series of cells. Rustam Pasha Madrasa has larger space at each of the corners, which is sufficient for Sinan to extend the room. Perhaps another madrasa that best exemplify this practice of optimizing space, is Jafar Am Madrasa, in Istanbul. Another freestanding madrasa built by Mimar Sinan, located right next to Hagia Sophia, a densely populated area. In the 60s and 70s, drastic interventions in Istanbul, had rendered historical buildings to be an obsolete element of the city. The urban form of the Ottoman city, was not preserved during that period. Scholars and experts expressed a contrasting view when it comes to restoring historical building, on modifying the architectural element to adapt to its new function. 
it was not used for long uh, decades or centuries. Teaching system has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, has changed. The traditional uh, using the systems, the spaces uh, has changed too much, and we have the new life for these old buildings, mm -hmm. a new function. Uh, we have the big task uh, to uh, to preserve, to conserve this rich heritage, which is not easy, you know, uh, because. In such big cities, there are several projects, uh, some transportation projects or any other projects, uh, and there is always a conflict between the conservation of this heritage and uh, the uh, evolution, let's say, of the city. It is a, bit, a big conflict. So we have uh, to find some proper ways to reconcile these two, uh, this history and the modern lives. The role of madrasas in Muslim world has been linked to the dawn of Islam. Until the medieval era of Islam, it had produced a large number of scholars, in all branches of knowledge, who bestowed inventions to the world in their respective field. Rustam Pasha Madrasa is an example of the system. Economic and education activities flourished in the neighborhood of this madrasa. The end of the madrasa system does not mean the end to Rustam Pasha Madrasa. Traditionally, the goal of madrasa is to produce a team who can interpret the education of Islam in relation to the demands of the specific time. Through modernization of the madrasa institution, its function could be rejuvenated, in accordance, to the contemporary demands. <laughs>